All right, welcome everyone. It's so nice to see you all. Thanks for joining. Hope you made a fabulous, but I know Murray just left, so it's not the right time to thank him. And Tova, I think she was here, but um, I'll thank him again when he comes. Oh, he left? Yeah. Then one week, sir. There, today, I wanted us, you have an extra thick packet in front of you, except for those joining us on Zoom. Just today's lesson is on the board. But if you're here in person, I wanted us have, to have a um, retrospective, a packet of everything we've covered so far. Um, Rabbi Josh is teaching is missing, so that, that'll have to update. But he did send it to me on time, so I appreciate that. <laughs> I called him 30 minutes ago saying, I need your source, but it was my, I couldn't get it in on my, on my end. Um, but the reason is when we started this class, the goal was to present stories to live by from our collection of Midrash. And um, I'm sharing with you the ones that have touched me on a soul level, that have really moved me and changed my life in a certain way. And, uh, but, but for this to be a complete class, right, each class we've discussed and you've you've shared your insights and you've deepened my understanding and relationship with these texts. I hope that the feeling is is mutual, but I wanted to have a class dedicated to reflection and really hearing from all of you. That's not this class, that'll be next class. I'm hoping that next class you could come in having reviewed, now I'm giving you homework now. Did you know that there's going to be homework in this class? But I'm giving you homework. Oh, is that right? <laughs> the hope is that you'll you'll review what we've done so far and come in ready to present. And by present, I mean just a couple minutes. It doesn't need to be more than a couple minutes. Of which Midrash speaks to you most? Some of the ones we've gone over and why? Absolutely. And if you feel, you know what? There's a midrash that I actually love that really has changed my life in a certain way that was not covered in this class. Please feel free to bring that one and present on that. But so next class, that's that'll be the bulk of next class is hearing from all of you. We have one more Can we help? Okay, okay. <laughs> all right. Does that mean that weeks from now you can go into something else? Potentially. So that's another at the end of the class, I'll ask you if you want to continue with Midrashim or if you want to move on to a different topic. Because at this point, we'll have had 10 classes with me on Midrash. Um, and I'm more than happy to continue on a Midrash, but if we wanted to choose a different topic, switch it up, uh, I'd be more than happy to do that as well. Um, but so just again, real quickly for next class, please come having reviewed and, and chosen one Midrash that you could speak to for just a couple of minutes or so about why this one impacted you, and if it's a midrash we haven't covered, but there's one that you love that has moved you in in, in some way, come with with that yeah. to 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 teach yeah. us. Does that sound good? Yeah. Cool. We'll be on the screen. Yes. Okay, that'll be for next Thursday. Yeah. With them. All right. So with that, let's move on to today's topic, which is about health. Um, help, oh. not hell, help. <laughs> the opposite. H e l p. More of those papers. Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah. Like the Beatles it. song. Yeah. Um, I thought those were synonyms. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, reason being that um, it goes without saying that we're all going through such a dark and terrible time. And, you know, we're going about our days and we're some of us, you know, we're all doing the best we can, but we're in need of help. And I think that as a synagogue community, we, we, we're we certainly trying, whether we're doing enough, whether it's effective enough, that's certainly to be discussed and debated. But we're definitely trying to help one another during these times, right? Whether it's our additional programs or the, the processing sessions with the counselors from um, Jewish Family Services, whether it's just conversations we're having at Minyan over breakfast, lunch, and learn like this, we're, we're trying to show up for each other and be there for each other and do what we can to help. So I wanted to do a deep dive on uh, our Midrashic sources on help. What does it mean to help? What does it look like to help? And what are the implications of help? How, how, how helpful can a basic act of kindness actually be when um, faced with 
the overwhelming darkness of our time? What, can a, what kind of light can even just a small act of kindness really do when held up to such, such imposing darkness? Just seeing your face is already making me feel better. <laughs> That's very nice. Thank you. And vice versa. All of you. Thank you. That's very sweet. So let's jump into our first Midrash. Uh, who would like to read? This is from uh, Talmud Bavli from Megillah. And Megillah, um, a lot of it is, is about halacha, of, of how do we read the Megillah? Um, can you, for instance, can you read it? Do you, can you read it backwards, out of order? Does it, can you know, who can read it? Um, can a minor read it? And, and Yotze, a, a congregation, Yotze means to put, make, uh, fulfill the obligation on behalf of. So what, what are the, it's a sort of halachic, but there's there's a beautiful, more narrative, agada um, midrash, but it comes actually from another halachic debate, which is this. Um, we say in our shacharit service, uh, right before the Shema, right? Baruch Ata Hashem, Elkinu Melech Alam, Yotzer Or, Uvorei Choshech, Ose Shalom Uvorei Tokol. Actually, it's not that one. I'm thinking it's um, Yotzer Hameorot. Blessing God who maker of the luminaries. And so the question is halachically, can a person who is impaired is 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 blind? Can a person who cannot see make that blessing over the luminaries if they can't actually see the luminaries? And in the context of this conversation comes from uh, there's a whole liter uh, category of our liturgy, kabbalistically uh, the category is Merkava literature. Merkava is the holy chariot described by Ezekiel. And the question is, how can we be, there are certain prayers that reference this. And, and the question, how can we make blessings over a divine chariot that presumably we've never actually seen? Maybe Ezekiel did, but we haven't. So how can we? That launches the rabbis into a conversation about the luminaries. If you're blind, how, can, how could you make a blessing over something that, that doesn't actually necessarily apply to you without it being an empty prayer, tefillah levatila, empty prayer? I, I imagine we have some resistance already, which yeah, I'm hoping well, I, for. I, I, yeah. would, I would say that the moon would be a harder, har, harder to do that with, but certainly the sun, he's he's getting benefit of having the sun, whether he can see it or not. Correct, right? So that's the first place you would go, and I'm glad you did, which is, wait, just because you can't see the luminaries doesn't mean that you don't benefit from it, right? Whether it's from the sun, warmth, uh, nutrients, right, vitamins, um, no, nothing would grow without it. Nothing would grow without it. So but food, you right? Feel the, 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 right? You would feel it. So sensorily, there are other ways to experience the luminaries, but also just in terms of um, benefiting from everything the sun does, right? <laughs> Life itself, okay. food. Yeah. Okay, here's the answer for the moon. Uh -huh. It affects the tides. It affects the tides, right? So there are other ways indirectly, right, and and directly, but not through not through vision. There was another hand. Also, there is something about the sun that uh, benefits you from the vitamin D and everything else with the bone structure. So there are much more to it than just to see. Right, exactly, right? So just the, the medical, the health benefits of the sun, you don't have to see to, to benefit from the sun. Therefore, you should be able to say that blessing Absolutely. and it applies to you. It's not the rabbis go a way we haven't touched on yet. These are all great answers. The rabbis go a different way to explain why it's okay. But let's have, and, and they do it through Midrash. So who would like to read our first text? Please, yeah, thank you. Rabbi, yes, I said, all of my life I was troubled by this verse, and you shall grope at noon as the blind man gropes in the darkness. So this is one of the curses that we get in, in Deuteronomy that, that describing how, how perilous our situation will be, that says, and you will grope at noon as a, as a consequence of our poor behavior. It's so a noon when it's presumably the sun is brightest, right? You'll still you'll grope around like a blind person does in the complete darkness. What does it matter to a blind person whether it is dark or light? Okay, so let's pause again. Sorry to keep interrupting you. I'm so oh, I'm sorry. So if you have the full packet, no. we're on the very back. The last page. Okay. Page 11. The first side no. of the page. No. Wait a second. I'm not there. Wait. Sorry, sorry. Page 11, page 11 in the packet. So, so far we have the rabbis bring this verse, the curse. 
You shall grope around in noon when the sun is at its peak brightness, but it'll, to you, you'll experience it as if you're a blind person in the dark. That's how dark it'll be even when it's so light. And then the question the rabbi said, but I'm bothered by this because what, what's, the, what's bothering the rabbi there? Rabbi Yosef? For a blind person, it's dark all the time. Right. So why does it matter if it's noon? Necessarily. Go ahead. Because, just because you're blind doesn't mean you don't see light and dark. Good. Different, different levels of blindness. Yeah, so that's another good explanation that that and the rabbis don't go there either. But that's another good explanation that well maybe you don't see it, but there's still there's still some you could see contrast maybe there's there's you might you might be able to sense a difference. Okay, so good. That's that's this bothering Rabbi Yossi. Don, you'll say. I continued to ponder the matter until the following incident occurred to me. I was once walking in the absolute darkness of the night, and I saw a blind man who was walking on his way with a torch in his hands. I said to him, my son, why do you need this torch if you are blind? He said to me, as long as I have a torch in my hand, people see me and save me from the pits and the thorns and the thistle. Okay. Yeah. So, so there we go. Another answer that that kind of came out of left field that, that I hadn't occurred to me, but but it, and it hadn't occurred to him for the longest time until it, until he actually had an experience with somebody who was able to explain how they perceived the world and how their lived experience. That actually this is helpful because others will see me. It, I, it doesn't help me see, it helps me be seen. Yeah. Let's go Sheila and then- well, Yeah, I mean, why do I go with a stick or something in the, in, my right. mother-in-law taught me this, <laughs> in the supermarket. If someone sees a stick, they could also take advantage of you, figure that mm. you're weak, but you have a weapon with you. Uh, interesting. Good. So it's it's not so much necessarily what it does for you, but what it projects to others. Yeah. Well, same thing with a cart in the shopping cart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything can be used. Yeah. <laughs> so also, since we live half the world in the dark, especially mm -hmm. in the winter time, it's getting there. And I used to drive in the middle of the night to the hospital early in the morning. And people were riding on bikes without yeah. the flashlight. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of accidents. Yes, right. And people are running, you know, they see no they can yeah. see us. Right. Not we can not always see them, especially if they are wearing all dark uh, right. clothes. Good. So so definitely when I see yeah. somebody with a flashlight, mm -hmm. I know that there is somebody there and I can avoid any fire. Good, good, absolutely. Or yeah. your yellow vest, your green vest. I was going to say, yeah. Rabbi Hal asked Rabbi Alex and I to get reflective vests. <laughs> right across the street. I know. Yeah. It's just a couple of houses away, but we do. We're right. But they turn right, they go. Right, they yeah. No, exactly. No, we they don't expect anybody to be walking. Right. Thing so everybody who lives in paper pipe, please vote for the sidewalks. I can't get political, no political. <laughs> I know, I know, but yeah, it's fair. Okay, we had one more, one more. Yeah, <laughs> we could, we'll have another offline. Well, we can talk about it. I think you've already said it. That's I, I was thinking about driving a car. With street lights, you can see perfectly fine without the lights on the car. Mm -hmm. Nobody can see you. Right. But, you know, even even this morning, I went out biking. Mm -hmm. I had the lights on on the bike, even though I could see perfectly well. Mm -hmm. It was for other people to see me. Mm -hmm. Right. Good. So that, that that's what I want to get to. So metaphorically, if we if we feel as I imagine many of us do, like this person in the story, sort of like the the blind man in the dark, right now in our lives. I, certainly I feel that way, just groping for not knowing. But but what he's doing is he holds up a torch. And it's not so that he can see any better, but so that he can be seen. Mm -hmm. And I, I think when, when asking ourselves about how as a community can we be there for one another and, and how do we respond in times of just complete and utter darkness, there there is so much to lifting up a torch and, and being Reach seen. Out. Reach Reaching out. out. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but that idea that if you don't wear a reflective vest or if you don't put your headlights on, you can't be seen. So that idea of how much, even when it's not these extreme times we're living in, just by virtue of life being hard in a community, how often are people suffering within our own community and we're not aware because mm -hmm. they're not, they don't have the reflective vest on. Exactly. I can tell you that having the cane 
it, it helps me on the one hand, but it allows other people to see it. Mm -hmm. And I've had people stop in the mm -hmm. car. Yeah. Let mm -hmm. me cross where otherwise I, I would not have had that difference. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. right. But it's hard. And I want to get to David, yeah. but it's it's hard because you're you by put raising up a torch, at least in the blind person's case, you probably become a subject of ridicule there, right? Like just like if I was saying, this peculiar. Why do you need that, right? So th there is a cost to putting on that vest or to raising the light, right? There, there's a stigma around asking for help. There's this idea in our culture that we should be self-sufficient. We shouldn't, we, you know, we, being vulnerable is, is risky. It comes with X, Y, and Z, right? So there are reasons why we don't, or we don't want to be a burden to other people, right? We say, you know, I can handle this. I don't, I don't, people have enough troubles, right? But, but what would it mean to, to say, despite all that, the part of being a community, I, I kind of have a duty in a way to raise up a torch and allow myself to be seen because that's part, you want to allow other people to see you. That's what it, they want to, right? That's what community, that's why we're in community. Go ahead. So this sort of blows a little bit into where I, where I was going, which is the other side of this particular coin is we're also taught elsewhere, you know, not to think the worst mm -hmm. of others. And he's automatically doing that by carrying the torch because he doesn't say, you know, I'm carrying the torch to swing it in somebody's face if they attack me. He right. says, I'm carrying the torch so nice. they can help me. But right. he assumes that it's going to result in help and not making him a target. Good. So I like that there's an optimism in holding up a torch in the darkness, right? So there's so much there that, that to hold up a torch at all and and fight against the darkness by offering light, by in the face of darkness and pessimism, committing an act of hope like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but go ahead. I'm trying to get to the point that our visibility at a rally or anything else mm. indicates our presence. And this is help to whoever needs the help. Yeah, but right now that is definitely friends. a way. Yeah, a any way that we stand with each other in solidarity and community, absolutely. But again, there there are risks, mm -hmm. just like with the right. Because is it then danger? Is there a danger to it? And mm -hmm. so that, that there's a lot to hold back from from raising a light, right? It's not something that's oh, we can all just you know, this is easy. We should all just do it. Yeah. But 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 how do we challenge ourselves? to do what's not necessarily an easy thing to do. And whenever there's a story about a blind person, I tend to ask, you know, th there's there's that literary motif or the irony that usually they're the ones who see most clearly and it's mm -hmm. the other characters that have a certain blindness, or certainly Homer and, and uh, with Greek uh, um, uh, myths, right? Like the Odyssey, there's always the, the blind seer, yeah. right? The, yeah, right? Blind seer. So, I wonder if there, you know, this this person elucidated Rabbi Yose, who who was blind to another person's experience. Why would why would how could you benefit? And the rabbis who are sort of there's a blindness in the conversation of, well, they don't benefit from the sun and the moon, so they shouldn't say this prayer. But it took a conversation to open Rabbi Yose's eyes. Right? Oh, now I I see better how you experience the world, and that's what community is all about. Like right? coming together, different people have different experiences and perspectives. And having our eyes open to somebody else's lived experience or or perspective of the world. Um, so there's there's trying to see, but also allowing yourself to be seen. Uh, let's move on to our next midrash. Um, okay, now this is a uh, they get into a um, debate on the word. Um, Let's see, Yashichena, right there. Yes, 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 yeah, thank you, yes, which can mean a couple of different things if you read it different ways, and that's sort of the midrashic wordplay that that they're going to explore here. Because based on how you define it, it could mean something very different. So let's. Who wants to read? This is going off of a, a verse from Mishlei from Proverbs that gives us. Um, helpful wisdom about how to deal with anxiety. Again, that goes into this Choshech HaFeilah that we're experiencing right now. What do we do with our anxiety? Uh, how, do we, how, do we, how do we seek help? Um, so who wants to read this verse or this uh, text? 
And this again is from the Bavli, but this time from Yoma, which spends a lot of time on Yom Kippur. So the Gemara, is the one verse in Proverbs, if there is anxiety in a person's heart, let that person quash it. So that's pain. one reading of it. Good, yeah. Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi dispute the verse's meaning. Rabbi Ami said one should forcefully push it, Yaskaina, out of one's mind. And Rabbi Asi said it means one should tell, Yaskaina, one's concerns to mm -hmm. others, which will lower anxiety. Mm -hmm. Good. So mm -hmm. I imagine that we, we, we all experience this tension of different ways of dealing with our anxiety. And again, it has to do with, do we want to be a burden to others? Do we feel like there's a stigma around talking about it with somebody, getting help in that way? But but there's two different ways to read it, all based on how you're reading Yasichena. Does it mean to quash it? Or does it mean to to tell your concern to others? Both yeah. theoretically well, having it. Go ahead. When it was written, it's a question of how, of what Nikudot, what vowels you add to it, which was all written without vowels. Right. But originally it was oral. Originally it was what? Oral. Oral. Put, right. right. So that I mean everybody could change it as they want. Right. Well, so uh, there's the creative, right? There's it's written this, but when you ch chant it, say it this way, the whole Masoretic tradition of adding vowels and and because we didn't have, right? So but that that leads to the questions because it's not always because we don't have it doesn't come to us. Vowel, although with the Masoretic tradition it, it does, but originally not. The question then is th there are there is room for interpretation on what what is this word actually, because we don't have that. So that's why both are that's why there's a machloka, that's why there's a debate. So I, I want to bring it to you. I mean, what are ways in which you feel squashing anxiety is actually the way to go and, and helps so that you could just sort of bulldoze through your worries and keep going? Because I don't think it's black and white. I don't think it's like clearly it's better. You can't quash it. You can't bottle it up. It's better to tell somebody. I think that's the the black and white version. Doesn't but it I, also depend on the personality involved? I mean, mm -hmm. some people deal with anxiety yeah. easily, mm -hmm. if you will, and some of those people are inclined to tell other people, "Just put it out of your mind," or "Don't think about it," or "Forget your troubles." Come on, get happy. Is right. As the old song lyric right. says. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily work. I the, my joke always was I'm my grandmother's grandson, so uh, I started worrying before I was born. So yeah. Something. <laughs> my grandmother used to have a little aphorism: "If you've got nothing to worry about, you've got something to worry about." Yeah, yeah. I like that. That's good. Uh, right. Right. Um. So, what about that though? In people's own experiences, do you feel like, you know? What are ways in which questioning it actually has worked for you? What are ways in which you've resisted telling others and why? And then finally, what are ways in which talking about it with others has, has proved helpful? Alina and the Jack. It happened to me last yeah. night at the Minion. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, I started crying and I couldn't hold it back. Mm -hmm. And I think Harriet noticed. And she came after the Minion to see what. It accumulated inside me watching all the stories from Israel and all of a sudden during the minion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was crying like mm -hmm. And you know what? It's a little better today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. So I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't but it came out. Mm -hmm. Something triggered it. Huh. Well, that, 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 that happened to some of the uh, prayers on Rosh Hashanah. Sure. For example, the one uh, who will live and who will die yeah. and all that. Right. And I know, when, well, when Michael was, well, Michael was still sick. He wasn't dying at that point. Or my father, I knew my father was dying. Uh, <laughs> the tears flowed. Mm. Right. So, so that's an example of. Um, so, so I feel like you didn't try to quash it necessarily. It sounds like what you're saying is I actually couldn't talk about it. Like there, there's some things that you want to talk about, but it is so beyond the ability to articulate in words. But so it needs to be expressed and it comes out in different ways. So for whatever reason, it, it, you, you could not articulate this deep pain and sadness, but it finds a way out. 
which then that was like the torch moment when you finally were crying because then it allowed Harriet to come over and put an arm around you or what, and you said, you're feeling a little bit better today, which, you know, thank God, you know, and I know it'll be a cycle. We'll go back down yes. into the darkness, but, yes. but for a, there was a little bit of release and relief there. And I think part of that had to do with Minion being in community. And then it started right away as we started the Minion. I don't know why. Wow. Right. It's like it's, building up. Yeah, and sometimes it's the liturgy, right, that brings it out of you, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, wait, sorry, I want to go to Helena, because she's, yeah, yeah, I told you, yeah. So, but then we'll go back. If you to talk about it with people to see, maybe they mm. see a different angle, or maybe they come from the same angle. So it helps. So we do it once a week with my Israeli friends on Zoom, and when whenever we can, we we do it in person, and we try once a week to for two hours to discuss all things that are bothering, <clears throat> bothering us. It's like self self mm -hmm. um, therapy. Psychiatry, yeah. therapy. Mm -hmm. exactly, mm -hmm. and they all understand each other because we have the same background. Mm -hmm. So some of us are Holocaust survivors, some of us are, most of us went through the wars in Israel. So we have the same background right. and now we see it happening again. Yes. The other thing is to do sex. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So when you do something, you forget, for you don't forget really, right. but you feel better <laughs> that you are doing something. Right. That's why I'm so much more in trouble now times than 50 years ago when I was mm -hmm. in Yom Kippur during the war because I was too busy right. helping others, yes. saving lives. I didn't have time to think about right. other things, my family or anything else. Right. So by doing things, Daka and stuff like this, or just reaching out to someone else, helping somebody else, it makes it makes you feeling better because yes. for a little time mm -hmm. you say, well, at least I cannot go now mm -hmm. and do what I did 50 years ago. Right. <laughs> but uh, they'll probably will get one look at me and say, you're too old. <laughs> no, they actually yeah. they actually asked even for retirement people mm -hmm. to put them on the list, but they got 500 physicians from Europe to come mm -hmm. and help them. Wow. Yeah, which but, is nice. It warmed the heart to hear all yeah. those things. Oh, yeah. I well, My brother, who's a medical student, his doctor mentor that he's been shadowing, that I'm I'm going to be out for a month. I'm going to Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In Florida. He's in Florida. So. But just a couple of things what you said sparked in me, and then I, I want to get to other, other voices here. But uh, one was, um, right, so there was somebody on the board here who said we need something for kids to do. We, they, yeah. they, you know, they just need, so that's why we did this lavender bagging and prayer or tying exercise. It was just something to, particularly for kids, but for everybody to come and have something physical to do mm -hmm. to, to feel like you're, because that's sometimes you just need something tangible. And children to write letters then, to the other children in Israel. Yeah. Also the children here in school to write letters to unknown right. children in Israel. Right. Because that's so, they were going to, yeah. So then one more thing, and then I want to get to these, but which is, um, there's a story that always, stuck with me um you may have heard it but somebody's trapped in a pit you know just like a blind person's with a <laughs> you may have heard this one his name is joe yeah uh no so he's, he's stuck in a pit and um first person you know screaming for help and uh you know a, a fireman fire person comes by and says okay I'll, I'll be back i'm gonna grab a ladder and he runs to the you know second person comes to you know a rabbi or a priest originally they just told me as a priest but you know, a rabbi comes by and says, you know, I'll send you prayers. You know, let's, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for for your, you to get out of here. And uh, and passes, you know, he thanks him, passes along, or thanks her, passes along. And then finally, a third person comes by, which is a friend. And the friend jumps right in the pit. And the person is stuck, said, well, what did you do that for? Now we're both stuck. You know, and the friend says, I've I've been in this pit before. I, I know what it's like, and I know the way out. Um. And and so, like you said, sometimes you just need somebody who's had the same experience, 
Or maybe they haven't had that experience, but they can really practice empathy. You have a friend who's just a good listener, who's not there to go get a ladder, who's not there to give prayers in that moment, but is willing to get in the pit with you even for a moment and say, even if I haven't experienced this, tell me what it feels like. I, I want to sit here with you for a little bit. Um, okay, there were a couple more hands. <laughs> to get to, yeah, let's go here. It's so important. How, if you if you're asking for the help, it's so important for the responder and how they respond to you. Mm -hmm. Because if it's a negative response, you're not going to do that again. You're going to hold it inside yourself. Mm -hmm. you Look at this. I bared my soul to yeah. you, and you you just showed me all the negatives. Mm -hmm. You didn't. I always say you can't always think with this. You have to think here. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to feel what I'm oh, feeling. Right. Good. So we were talking about why people don't always hold up a torch. Fear of getting burnt, right? Like you, you might get burnt by that experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, my late husband used to say about me, when things were very stressful to the point of being unbearable, that I was afraid I, I might sink, he said, you you create another world in inside your head. It's mm -hmm. a better place. Mm -hmm. And that, that was helpful to you, huh? Yeah. I, I do create other worlds in my head. Mm -hmm. Spoken like the artist you are, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's the question is an artist, right? Do you create the world as it is or as it should be? Right. And sometimes with your art, it's sometimes a more photorealist or or it's uh, impressionist or it's what well, do you see? Every what right. is it differently? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, let's move on to our next text. Again, these are rabbinic uh, uh, takes on how do we how do we show up for one another. And I'm afraid the Taibul is tuning in to a study that I know that Betham has done in the past. These texts. So you even before Betham, I'm sure you were familiar with these texts. But I'm worried you're rolling your eyes a little, going, Ah, these ones. <laughs> but always good to, to return to well. them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, let's Please, move on. Wants to talk to you. No, oh, I think she was just, uh, she was uh, saying she agrees with that she's seen this before. But. <laughs> no, um, no okay. actually, it's not whether I've seen it before. It's just so interesting to hear everybody. And even when I can't see the voices that I recognize, like I think I knew it was Jackie even before you referred to her <laughs> art, I find there's always something new to learn. And what's the Perke of Os that says, who's the wise person, one who learns from everybody? So that's right. I think it's cha uh, chapter four, verse, chapter four, one, four, one. <laughs> well, must be a rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, this is Talmud Bavli again, Brachot. Um, this is a story of a teacher and a student um, responding to, to illness. So let's go. Who wants to read in the English? Either in person or on Zoom. Anybody's welcome. Go for it, Helena. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbi Yohanan entered to visit him and said, to him, is your suffering dear to you? Rabbi Chia said to him, I welcome neither this suffering nor its reward. Okay, just a quick pause, which is, this is sort of a theological assumption that the rabbis are making here, which is that if you, you know, that, that it's sort of going back from what we talked about the crime and punishment theology. Mm -hmm. So if, if you are ill and you embrace it instead of resist it, or you see it as, you know, the, a purifying experience, like maybe I'm either being punished for a sin or there's something to be learned here because this is part of God's plan and I just need to accept it. Then if, you know, you'll, you'll receive a reward, right? So that's why you, you have the, the um, teacher who in this case, Rabbi Yochanan is Rabbi Chia's teacher. So Rabbi Yochanan saying to the student, you know, is your suffering dear to you? Right? Sort of this 
theological level of you know it, are, are you embracing this for the better for the reward and and the student responds which i think we can all relate to when you're in suffering or pain like no i i would rather not receive the reward and not be going through what i'm going through right now right which is again when it comes to like chaplaincy or or uh visiting in on the sick often what they don't want or if somebody asks for help is the like solutions or the sort of you know heady you know, well, actually there's a silver lining here because X, Y, or Z, right? You don't want that. You're in pain and you just want somebody to visit you and hold that pain and hear you, right? Be seen, you wanna be seen. Yeah. So that's sort of what he's saying here. Like, you know, I'd rather not have the reward and not suffer. Uh, okay, keep reading, sorry, I interrupt. Yo, Rabbi Yohanan said to him, give me your hand. Rabbi here, Bar Abba gave him his hand and Rabbi Yohanan stood him up and restored him to health. Okay, so there's either two things going on here. One is either magic or or some sort of like spiritual power that Rabbi Yochanan has to, to heal the sick like this. The other is a contrast between two different responses to somebody who's sick. One is the like <laughs> silver lining, theological, you know, conceptual um, problem solving, which did nothing for him. He rejected. The other was, give me your hand. Masse. Yeah, something, doing something, right? going back to doing something, but also just like not having the words necessarily in that moment, but just showing up, it's jumping into the pit, mm -hmm. right? It's not giving you the prayers or even the ladder, no solutions and no prayers in this moment. Empathy. Yes, empathy, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. a form of prayer and action. Sometimes right? a, a hug is what yeah. people need. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. and that is what works. That's what heals him. That is the one thing that people, I think the Jews have over some other religions. You don't say go pray. Right. Or at least Instead, yeah. We hold a hand and say Right. Or pray, but let that let that uh inspire action. Right. And and we're gonna come back to this. So that's actually a great a great point, right? About the, you're the getting, what you're basically doing is getting it out of your system. Mm -hmm. I was I used to make fun of the Tehillim. I mean and then when I was sitting by Michael Tide, you know, day after day, at the end, not at the beginning, because it you know, I had nothing to do really. I had there's nothing I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And then I understood oh, it was something that was taking the space in my mind so that I wasn't thinking of what was happening to him. Yeah. Oh, there you go. It right. Didn't so have to be yeah. to Hillen, but it was just and but it had to be something. Spiritual. Right, exactly. That I didn't have to remember. Yeah. I think the point is, it wasn't, I couldn't read a book. Yeah. I needed something that was going to go through my mind, blank it out. Yeah. And so beautiful, right? So so we connect to prayer in so many different ways. There's multiple points of entry. It's not just, it doesn't just need to be this, you know, more orthodox, traditional, you know, this actually prayer you know, causes God to act. It has to be a way. formula. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. There are other ways to engage with it that's meaningful, and that's very important. Um, okay, good. So let's keep reading. So now, now, so that was Rabbi, originally it was Rabbi Hia Baraba, the student that fell ill. Now the opposite, right? So similar, now the teacher falls ill. Rabbi Hanina entered to visit him and said to him, is your suffering dear to you? Rabbi Yohanan said to him, I welcome neither this suffering nor its reward. <laughs> right, so it's, so I, I, answer yeah. the same way. No right, and I don't read it tongue in cheek, but maybe you could sort of like, okay, now that you're where I was, you know, does this help you when I say, <laughs> you know, at least you're going to be rewarded for that, you know? And he said, nope, nope, you're right. I don't, but you don't have to read it that way. It could just be a kind thing to do. Like the, these are our rabbis. Of course, they're going to think this way. And it's, it's nice. It's, it's, was Rabbi Hanina another student or another teacher? Same. So it's the same two people. Uh, you had Rabbi Yochanan, who is Rabbi Hanina's teacher. And originally Rabbi Hanina was sick, the student. Oh, it says Hila. It's a different name. Oh, oh, oh. You know what? I always make this mistake. I always make this mistake. Thank you. So it's different. They both begin with eight. It is different. Ah, I need to leave a note where I'll actually see it. I always just lazily assume it's the same. Two. What you need to do is to not put it at the bottom of the page. <laughs> yeah, so you can see the difference. Okay, good. Look at it. 
more as not necessarily even formulaic, but this is maybe the way these particular rabbis may be led by Rabbi Yochanan, who's a, you know, a very big figure, right? Yes. Um, it is another student. Approach this yeah. kind of situation. that They've either all learned that this is how you approach the situation, at least the initial approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like in the case of uh, Hanina, he learned something else also. Right. Good. Yeah. So let's, so, let's keep so reading. What, yeah, I, what I've gotten out of this, uh, when you get to the point where stop where it says the Gemara, up to that point, that's all I'm getting out of it is visit the sick uh -huh. and it'll help. What? Good. Yeah. Well, actually, that, that is that is the enduring understanding. But I want you when we read to the end, you'll see yeah. the impact of it, the, the sort of the broader. Well, I already read it. But. Oh, OK, <laughs> but that, that is what it is. Simple, but 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 actually very profound. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So Rabbi Hanina this time. And stood him up and restored him to health. Oh, wait, did we, sorry, similar, let's go back from the beginning. So similarly, Rabbi Yochanan fell ill. So now the teacher from the beginning, Rabbi yes. Hanina's teacher, falls ill, and we have and a, somebody else, visit. another, yeah, Rabbi Hanina comes to visit. Another student. Mm -hmm. Another age. Yeah. stood him up and restored him to health. Okay. The like Gemara asks, why did Rabbi Yochanan wait for Rabbi Hanina to restore him to health? If he was able to heal his student, let Rabbi Yochanan stand himself up. Don't like the, the Gemara answers. <laughs> yeah. The Gemara answers. They say a prisoner cannot free himself from prison. Ah. Right. So if they need someone else to heal somebody. Yes. Right. Unless <laughs> so he breaks out, yeah. Right. So let's say it's that first one. Remember we said it's either like a pastoral message yeah, about empathy versus like problem solving, or it's it's magic, some kind of magic. So the Gemara actually plays with it as if it's a sort of magic or spiritual power that clearly Rabbi Yochanan had the power to revive the sick. He could, right? We, we know that he did that with his student. So why doesn't he just do it to himself? Is the question. He has that power, and the answer being that it, need somebody else's help. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's about someone else coming and holding your hand. Can That's just, what restores. Okay. For the sake of context, because uh, I want to make sure I'm understanding the context in which they're operating. If I understand correctly, the non-Jews and Bob Bobel, uh, who were basically Persians or dominated by Persians, did have a lot of sense of magic. Mm. But theoretically, we're not supposed to understand this as magic. We're supposed to understand it maybe as they merited. They had such high merit, they yes. could achieve Correct. something Correct. that maybe you or I wouldn't be able to achieve. Right, right. I, right. I shouldn't throw around the word magic because we're not actually talking about magic here. We're talking about merit, right? That some such a righteous person could, could uh, you know, channel God's power in that way but however they actually did it i guess the point that we're coming through today is that the act of helping someone physically um because apparently the only part that's actually in there itself is stood him up and restored him to health is the commentary on stood him up mm -hmm. so uh i'm just paying attention to what's bold and what's that yeah uh so it's the act of offering that help yeah. That seems to have made all the difference. Right. And here's what's interesting. So uh, sometimes we pray and we say, what are these prayers mean? Or or I don't actually yeah. believe God does these things. So how can I say that God does these things? Right. And, and if you look at the Hebrew at the very end, Ein Chavush, oops, yeah. um, to Amri, he said, "Ein kavush matir atzmo mi beit haasurim." Mm -hmm. What's the prayer that comes to mind? Matir asurim, right in in the Birkot um, Shachar. Matir asurim. Say again about the wedding. No. Yeah, in the wedding also. Mm. Where is it in the wedding? Uh, isn't there something there to say that? Um, uh, 
Oh, heresy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. Right. No, marriage is about going into captivity, yeah. right? This is just kidding. That's kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I know. I know. She does. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, I it's I am the happiest married person though. <laughs> Just a joke. Uh, but right, so Matira Serene, blessed are you God who frees the captive. Um and in a story where it's it's people doing that for other people. Right. So often when we we say the prayer, it for me it's not magical thinking or going back to that, and I mean it is magic, or it's not, you know, God do X, Y, and Z. It's God channel through us to do what you do through us. Let, let us do, you know, th that is the God in us that could lead us to free the captive, right? So that, that to me is often when I pray, that's how I interpret it, that I'm not that's saying- the inspiration. Right. God is the inspiration to do good deeds. Right. And that's what, why pray so many times. Why pray three times a day? Why, you know, why do we say, why say the same prayers over and over? Because we we need that constant reinforcement that these are the these are the values we live by. These are this is what we believe. And this is what we have to do every day. Um. So so visiting somebody. Uh, what what if the next time you visit somebody who's sick, you you actually think of it as freeing the captive, and that doesn't mean that they're gonna you're gonna raise them up and they're gonna be healed again. But in a small way, something that is so small that seems so small. Can actually be so have such grand mm -hmm. reverberations, and you don't know, and you don't know, right. right? That you that that is a way that we can free captive, and especially right now where we are literally captive. Our brothers and sisters are literally captive, and that's the chosha hafela. That's this great darkness that we feel so blind and or powerless in. Right? We feel what can we do? How can we right? How what can we actually free the captive? And we pray that you know because we do need prayer. What we pray. Thank you, Tyro. Nice. Yes. Right. Right. Redeeming the, the captives. Um, right. So we pray. It's part of our prayers because we do need prayer and, 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 and prayer is powerful. But we also do what we can in every other way. Right. With with donations, with support, with speaking out. Right. All these ways in which we can make a little impact, at least. But even in our then take, take a step back further to our interpersonal lives where if we're so right, we all need to do something in these moments. So how do we, if we feel like, you know what, if we're being realistic, I personally don't feel like I have the power to free my Israeli brothers and sisters in captivity, personally. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's different when you harness the power of community and all that, but just taking a step back to giving into that feeling of, you know. But if you write a letter to your Congress, correct. then. Then and I have, sounds right, and I have. I've called and I've written letters. You got to do so. I'm not saying don't, do, but, but, but even you do what you can. But there's still this feeling of, but I can't literally go over there at like Superman and and rescue. Yes. But so how in your own lives can you matira surim? How, how can you free the captives in your own interpersonal lives? There are different kinds of cat captivity. Yeah. I, my daughter had volunteered at, at a hospice at one part of her life, and there was a man there who only spoke Spanish, and there was nobody mm. around. Mm that he could talk to. And he had small children, and only when his small children were there he, did he perk up. Mm -hmm. But my daughter started talking to the children in Spanish, mm -hmm. and then she spoke to their father in Spanish, and it was like lighting yeah. fire. I'm sure. And she was able to talk to that family in Spanish. and. It mm -hmm. opened him up. Mm -hmm. So it was a release from the captivity yes. of inability to communicate. Right. And it all ties together, right? Because it's being seen. In that moment, he felt seen because he was literally so too heard. Yeah. 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 Because well, I speak six languages. Mm. And I was working in a place where a lot of the West Side come, a lot of Polish people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From here in Mount Sinai, the Yiddish talking, they didn't speak a word of English and they couldn't communicate. Most Americans speak only English, unfortunately. Yeah, right. The gratitude of the patient that I came and said, I, I understand you speak only Polish or only Yiddish or something. You cannot believe how much I cannot believe in this place I find a Jewish person here and here. 
they were so amazed, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So so it's just, and I didn't do much. I right. just came to talk to them, right. you know? I was not even taking care of them. Yeah. They were assigned someone else. But it made such a difference. Yes. And the children of this man, they were captive of fear mm. that their father was going to disappear. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So, so there is no question that we have to continuously be thinking about the literal, our, our captives and what we can do, play our small part or big part when harnessing collective power to, to get them back home safely. But if you're looking in your day-to-day -day life for a way to honor the captives and to feel like you're doing something to free the captives, th there are ways spiritually to, to fight anti-Semitism with the opposite of that, which is you know, senseless hatred with senseless love, right? Mm -hmm. Or causeless hug, right? Sina Khinam with, how would you say it? Sina Rahava, right? That, mm -hmm. right? Like senseless love to, to, to show up for people and say, because of all there of this hate. There is no senseless love. There is senseless hate, but yeah. there is no senseless love. Good, okay. That love always has a reason. Yeah. In a, 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 I, I love that. Love that. Years, she reads for the blind. Uh huh. And then I see Tybal's hand. I'm going to get to you in a second. Yeah. yeah. Oh, she reads for the blind. Amazing. Amazing. Incredible. Yes, every week, she she has newspapers and she reads the daily newspapers. Yeah. For the blind community that taps into this this organization. Incredible. Amazing. Right. There's so much you could do. Tybal. Yeah. I know it may it may not fit because you were on the visiting the sick as the or if I've gotten it that one of the big takeaways. But I just wanted to say is in terms of redeeming the captives, what I think we can do as Americans in America is be active on the second front of the war, which is the PR, the the positioning right. of who I'll just say this because this is today's news, like who actually is targeting civilians. I'll just leave it at that. And we, it, not just our elected officials, but public opinion is so powerful that when right, we right. see distortions in whatever publication or something, that that's what we can do to redeem the captives because if the world yes. atmosphere were different. Right. Uh, the, the world, I, I mean, can you just imagine America holding back in Afghanistan or whatever to right, allow right. humanitarian aid holding back the ground and now I'll be quiet. <clears throat> right. No, absolutely. And I, I just want to add to that, that for, for me and where I want to go with this tech study is love and empathy and outreach mm -hmm. as ways to combat hate. And in that PR battle as well, the overpowering urge is to lash out and yell and demean and and I and I'm not I'm not um shaming that because sometimes it's that you just but you know I have friends in Israel who you know using expletives to and and publicly you know f mm -hmm. this f you f that right all of the and and I'm not judging that especially going through what you're going through but from where I'm sitting and from and from where I I have I'm, I have the privilege to be able to preach about responding with love and empathy as a way to fight <laughs> that PR battle and saying, we're not gonna stoop to, to those levels of hatred. We're gonna fight back with, with love and understanding. Uh, Nelson, yes, and then Sheila, yeah. When I was on Facebook, there seemed to me to be a lot of reaching out in a very bad way. It felt mm. good, but it was really destructive. Mm. Uh, People hated, you know, it, 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 it encouraged hatred because right. you, you just felt it would just stir your emotions because I could punch back. Right. Right. And, and we need to stay away from that. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say, and maybe it's just too simple minded, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about giving, but you also have to learn to receive. Yes. And that's that I think goes right back to the torch, the blind person to write. How do you project that you're ready to receive and willing to receive? 
Good. Sheila and David, and then I want to close with one more thought. You just are introducing what I'm going to say is one of the ways we can get back is that when other groups, I mean, a lot of Gentiles have called me up, you know, and say, how do you feel and whatnot? And to remember, if they have such a, uh, it's really an ethnic mm -hmm. or a religious um, thing happen, that we can reach out to them. Yeah, no, absolutely, right? We have to remember that, you know, it's okay to call someone from another right. world or whatever, another religion, and, and reach out to them. Right. I think that is them. a yeah. great response, right, to, mm -hmm. to continue to reach out and partner with other people and their pain and suffering to say that that's what we do. At the same time, I want to acknowledge that I think there's this big feeling of betrayal and loneliness where it's like many people who have been showing up for other communities and feeling like, well, now why aren't you showing up for us when we need it? So, That's right. But, so, right. Wait. So the Black Lives Matter and yeah. they are stabbing us in the back. Right. So, the, but then the question is, do we then burn the bridge, or do we continue to affirm values we believe in and say, you know, you know, well, connection is more important, not disconnection, even though we feel that burning. You know betrayal and but I, I want to David and then I need I want to finish the last thing. We're now showing it's now being shown that it's a good thing that we did re remain friendly with Qatar because now they're trying to help us with the hostages, even though they are the taking care of the Hamas. Yeah, they're taking care of the Hamas, but that gives us somebody to talk to to serve as an intermediary. It's because strategy. Hamas is not going to talk to us. Right. Many have come to kill us. You that only want is to annihilate you. Right. Yeah. Deal with something like yeah. this. So and Hamas is getting it, trying to get both sides to uh to cut to, to the idea of community relations is not to bend over so somebody can ream you up you know where. It is to go in with your eyes wide open and try to some changes and make some friends so that you'll have some friends when you need them. And right. maybe not everyone will be your friend, right. but somebody what might be. Right. And this reminds me of uh, a book that we read, written by a young Palestinian man from Gaza whose house was occupied by Israeli soldiers and one of their bullets hit him. Mm -hmm. And he's taken into Israel to a hospital where they uh, operate on him successfully and restore him to health. Mm -hmm. And the question comes up, why, why would you do this? I mean, you know, okay, it was an accident that you shot me, but why would you even, why would you spend your resources mm -hmm. on your enemy? Right. And the idea which brought him around to being some kind of friend, despite the fact that he was, uh, a Palestinian from Gaza, and we <laughs> want to lump everybody together and so call them all Hamas okay. uh, as somebody who actually could be a friend. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's right. Maybe that will lead to peace in the future. God only knows, but that one person at a time. Right. Right. And honestly, I think that's a perfect place to end. But I do want to just Rabbi, Rabbi. Yes, type. Sure. I'm sorry, may I add one thing? If I can bring yeah. it back to B'nai Yashirin. Uh -huh. Speaking as someone who I am disabled, I'm chronically ill. Not only do I need to be home, but I'm often on bed rest. Uh -huh. The way B'nai Yashirin does its evening minion with the schmooze time after, mm -hmm. everybody who schmoozes with me is doing the mitzvah of visiting the sick. Oh, thank you, yeah. that's that's really heartwarming. And 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 you by you know you're also giving us that opportunity again from the by by reaching out and allowing us to be there for you. Yeah. Um, so, so thank you for always showing up. You also have a lot to add yeah. to yeah. what we say, Bible. Yeah. Yeah. You're here. So that yeah. you know, <laughs> your your work encouraging. I enjoy <laughs> your voice. So I, I always you. I always want to be mindful and respectful of time. So I just I'm not going to go through this last text. It's really just one. This is a, a context for the midrash in the end. Here it's from Ruth Rabba. Yeah. And yes, yeah, so, <laughs> let's hear it for Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the, the context here is and asking ourselves how powerful can what se a seemingly small act of kindness actually be in reality, 
right? Going to visit somebody who's sick, actually healing them, right? Like what, what does small acts of kindness in dark times actually accomplish? And, and this piece from Ruth Rabba says, it uses a midrashic technique called Gezer Shava, which is taking two, you know, one word that's mentioned here, and then another word mentioned in a different verse, and then link, bridge, reaching out, right? Re, re, connecting those and saying, well, now we can understand what this verse means based on what it means here, right? And that's midrash, putting verses in conversation with each other. So what it does here is it takes the word halom, mm -hmm. come here, right? Which which is what Boaz says to Ruth. Ruth is an outsider. What's the word for dream? Halom. 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 Oh, okay. yeah. But honestly, <laughs> I think that's a great run, a uh, uh, personal midrash that you're adding to this because... The, the, a small yeah, act yeah. having the potential to, to realize a much larger dream. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, Boaz reaches out to an outsider, to Ruth, somebody who historically as a Midianite, right, should not be, is barred from entering into the Jewish oh, fold. Mm -hmm. You cannot marry a, a Midianite. It's one of the forbidden nations yeah. to, to marry. But Boaz, but then the rabbi said, well, it says, a, you know, Midianite, not a Midianite. She's a Midianitess, so it's okay, so, right? She, mm -hmm. It only it only bars the masculine, not the feminine. That's how the rabbis get around it. But either way, <laughs> Bo, right? Those rabbis. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, and I said Midianite. I meant Moab. Moabite, correct, Moabite, right? right. So it says Moab. Uh, you know, don't allow Moabite, Moabite, but but she is a feminine Moabitess, so it doesn't say anything about that, right? But point is, Boaz reaches out to an outsider, bringing her into the fold, saying, "Come here." A small act of kindness in this case is just come and partake of the meal, dip your bread, have a little something to eat, right? But that small act of kindness, uh, um, mushrooms. thank you, mushrooms into none other than the Mashiach, right? King David comes from Ruth, uh, I think a couple generations down, right? So um, that ushers in the era of the Messiah. So what if you, just like if you, the next time you visit somebody who's sick, think of it as the power to uh, Matir Asurim, free the captive. What if the next time you you have a small outreach, act of kindness to somebody, welcoming them into the fold, something nice, come have a meal, have a, you know, that that actually, that small act has the potential to mushroom into none other than changing the face of ushering the era of the Messiah, hastening our redemption, which again goes into Pidion right into redeeming the captives but that's not right because what they're doing is downplaying Ruth. they're both they're boosting up <laughs> yeah the rabbi Ruth said to do that it's and putting yeah. Ruth down good yeah. she's the one who stayed with naomi otherwise this wouldn't have happened. good which will lead us to our our left i want to do a, a feminist midrash as like a, one more whether we go through with midrash again or not maybe at the end of our session tomorrow after you share with us we'll do we'll do a the first round is um Next week, next week, share with me, go through this packet and share, <laughs> share with me what your favorite one has been, whether it's on this list or not, and how, you know how it has moved you. We'll do a go around and then I'll do one final session on Midrash about a feminist Midrash. And then from there, we can decide if we want to continue with Midrash or take on a new topic. So thank you, everybody, for, for learning. Sorry, we're ending a little bit later. Yeah. Don't forget the compost. But these th these do not compost. The spoons don't. But the napkins do. 